okay so very good afternoon to all of you and today again we are back with a session on masters abroad right so personally when i started my career uh, i and shraddha we both started together only it's a privilege that uh, shraddha is my first uh, actual friend or maybe student whatever you call okay so very bright and very focused so today we are here to basically talk out and break the myths of masters in actuarial okay it's a one year program uh, which is conducted by many colleges in london okay and shraddha is also pursuing she has almost completed it before that uh, she has good years of experience in life insurance sector general insurance in, in gi sector okay in gi sector and now she is almost uh, done with the uh, masters program with some formalities and some final exams are done or they are pending exams are left she is about to get a degrees okay. okay so see the point is that uh, it's not uh, always necessary that uh, whatever we know we should do it but today we are here to break some common myths so we should hear it out uh, the journey which shraddha has uh, carved for herself basically the path which she has chosen and being very honest she is not from a very affluent family because uh, we personally are of the opinion that the students those who are studying in the uk or they have gone for the masters they are very rich and they have got lots of money but it's not like that shraddha has struggled very hard and uh, she is there on loan this is what we have gathered from the sources okay and she has worked hard to basically have a very good position in the industry first and now taking such a brave step okay uh, she is there to complete the higher level papers for her uh, career okay so shraddha uh, just tell us and guide us how was the journey where you started with actuarial and you were in bangalore right where uh, mm -hmm. there is not much mentoring available so there were a lot of roadblocks because the college exams used to clash as far as i remember so what motivated you and how was the journey please guide us so good evening everyone firstly i would like to start by introducing myself most of you know my name is shraddha agarwal and i was born and brought up in uh, west bengal in a small town called parakar it's near kolkata and uh, i pursued my school from asansol and then i did my graduation undergrad from mount carmel college bangalore i did bsc in economics mathematics statistics uh, i gra i graduated back in 2018 post which i worked for a, approximately 4 years more than 4 years basically and uh, uh, after uh, working for 4 years i joined base business school in msc actuarial management course and here i am today almost towards the end of the course so uh, i would like to start by talking about my actuarial journey so i started way back in 2016 in my college second year so uh, that time i was in bangalore and i did not have much support so actually at that point of time there were not uh, there, there were not many actuarial tutors available in bangalore and uh, like i said i i was pursuing bs economics mathematics and statistics which itself is a very big course very hectic course so uh, i i uh, i used to go back home that time and i used to take uh, to the uh, i used to uh, i used to be like uh, in contact with pravin bhaiya and uh, he used to mentor me when i was at home during my vacations and that is how i managed to clear uh, th three to four papers during my undergrad post which i started working and uh, my work experience is more into general insurance and i've specialized in general insurance also now and uh, so I, i assume most of you are uh, uh, in your undergrad right now yeah shraddha the crowd is mixed like they are in their first year some of them are about to graduate mm -hmm. some of them are working okay so it's like that okay perfect so yeah so when i was uh, I, uh, so my last firm was future generally india insurance 
on the general side i was working on the general side so when i uh, uh, when i almost had like 3 years of experience i thought of pursuing uh, actuarial management from base and i uh, i was not sure back then because like bhaiya said i was not from a very rich family and spending a lot of money was a very big uh, is was, was a very big good decision on my part leaving my job behind and spending so much money on a course which does not guarantee exemptions people usually have a myth that uh, clearing papers from abroad going into universities abroad and doing the actuarial management actuarial science course means you'll easily get through the papers which is not true it's not a cake walk trust me i have seen people struggling here not everybody gets exemptions there are people who haven't got exemptions even in one subject so if you uh, so see i would say that this course is really good if you have little experience but for freshers it is a bit difficult because uh, you will be uh, doing your specialization papers here and the specializations becomes easier when you have work experience because you can relate to it so uh, i wouldn't suggest anybody to come as a fresher and join the actuarial management course which i will talk about the structure i am going to talk about later but i would ex i would actually advise everyone to at least come with 2 years of experience okay so the one thing which uh, you correctly pointed out are regarding the exemptions that it's not an exchange for money that if the yeah. universities are taking the money that is a guarantee that they are going to provide you with the exemption this is a very good thing uh, which you pointed out so sada i would like to ask you a question that what encouraged you first of all to take the course so that the students those who are having the similar mindset they can first at least start thinking about uh, doing this program so what encouraged you and basically what are the initial steps that a student should take or basically move into that like you correctly pointed out that some work experience maybe 1 to 2 years of work experience is quite good because the students they will be doing their specialization papers there right so uh, what uh, encouraged you to uh, basically take this course so uh, like when i was working i did not have any time to actually study for my papers i i was working on the non life reserving side and uh, april exams used to clash with our year ends and during september also we used to prepare for the quarter ends and all so i had literally no time my team was also very small uh, in non life sector of general uh, of future generally so we hardly used to get any study leaves and uh, i started as you i started realizing that even though i'm doing well work wise i'm lacking behind in papers and it is important for an actual student to complete all the papers because after some point your growth will st get stagnated you need papers as well as experience just not experience just not papers is not, uh, will help you need a mixture of both so that is how i uh, that is how i uh, actually came up with this idea of um pursuing this course and uh, like i spoke to a couple of my colleagues ex colleagues who also had taken this route and i took advice from them and then i realized that i can't pursue this course so this is how i got into this course and the initial steps being like um, so uh, firstly like there are many uh, uh, many like uh, institutes providing this course in the uk the actuarial management uh, course or equivalent courses i chose for base because i was doing general insurance and uh, heriot what does not um, offer general insurance if i am not wrong secondly can uh, does in can uh, does uh, provide general insurance but then they don't uh, give you an option to clear your older papers like old by older papers i mean cs2 cm2 you don't offer those papers so for me the best option that was the be... best fit for you basically yeah. there are few universities like we are also uh, preparing a document which we'll be sharing with all our students in some time the document is almost ready with the feedback of shatta and few more students uh, those who are pursuing this course abroad the document will share so that was the perfect fit for you the, the college which you chose was a perfect yeah. fit for you right okay 
so uh, shruta i have heard that there are few uh, initial exams that the student must clear in order to be eligible right so yeah. how many exams uh, are minimum required so that the student is at least eligible for the program okay so uh, see uh, firstly i would like to talk about base uh, actually programs there are two management uh, there are two msc programs offered by base in the actuarial side one is actuarial science i mean the other one is actuarial management not many people know about actuarial science so the actuarial science is for those who haven't even cleared any papers who just wants to start with their actuarial journey or for those who want to change their career path and the second course is actuarial management which i just pursued uh, for actuarial management one must have cs1 and cm1 already cleared to get into this course okay and yeah so minimum two papers are required right yeah min minimum two subject like subject to the condition that cs2 and cm cs1 uh, cs1 and uh, cm1 are cleared okay okay there are few more requirements but these two papers are a minimum right cs1 and cm1 okay so uh, basically shraddha uh, few more international exams uh, that a student must clear in order to basically get into these uh, foreign universities like apart from having uh, four to five weeks. because see the point is if a student is a graduate then the student has a minimum of four to five exams so the number of exams criteria is not much of an issue so if a student plans to get into these universities so uh, like uh, are there any other exams that the student should uh, clear in order to get into these uh, universities uh, you must clear ielts one must clear ielts to get into um, to get into this course because uh, uh, because the uh, institutes want to know that you can speak english you can write english and you will not face this problem when you come your study in the uk so this okay. uh, it's very important and the institute also specifies the minimum marking that you should get in each segment like speaking reading writing so uh, this is an important factor to consider okay okay so this uh, the exam criteria is okay and ielts also a uh, student uh, must clear right okay yeah. so the uh, like the indian mindset is like uh, the students they are not very affluent for example uh, yeah. let's take a average household okay and if the candidate wants to get the international exposure so uh, how is the uh, basically loan route so for example uh, the cost as far as i know is roughly uh, 30 lakhs if i am not wrong 25 to 30 lakhs uh so the cost actually currently the pounds is approximately 105 or 106 and uh, so and the fees which we paid was 23500 pounds okay and there's a 10 percent increase i think every year so approximately so 25 to 27 lakhs because see yeah. uh it's not only about uh, then again you uh will be needing some materials and maybe some like the general things right so uh, here if you're studying so uh, maybe some device laptop etc so the education part is roughly 30 lakhs right so how to yeah you can go education part would come to around 27 28 lakhs yeah okay, approximately so 30 lakhs to, uh, to be taken on the higher end okay and uh, uh, so there is travel cost involved there's uh, cost involved in um, giving aisles also and uh, uh, apart from the education part there is accommodation cost as well so okay. so shadda like a, a, a person of, from an average uh, household so how can they basically uh, try to get the finance because see in india we see the if the university is indian so for example in the case of mba it happens that if you are from top 10 or maybe from top 12 top 15 then getting the finance is little bit easier okay uh, but if you uh, do an mba from maybe top 30 or maybe top 40 then the finance becomes really difficult and since we know that there is no job guarantee in these uh, uh, masters program that there is no job guarantee that you will 100% uh, get a placement there so why will the bank finance and if yes what is the process 
or maybe some route which the students can opt for so that the uh, the fees don't become a burden for the parents yeah so uh, like there are several banks there almost every bank is willing to give education loan so coming to um, coming to government banks you, uh, one must provide mortgage to secure an education loan and the in rate of interest charged by government banks is quite low as compared to private banks and um, and private banks uh, private banks do not like totally cover the cost of the fees there will be a certain proportion that you'll have to bear out of your own pockets okay so yeah mean... and, and the, apart from that uh, there are nbfcs also like incred uh, hdfc credila so you can check the nbfcs uh, they'll be willing to provide uh, the entire cost but the rate of interest charged by them is quite high but okay. uh, i totally feel that if you are struggling with exams it's totally worth it to come for the course because uh, everything will um make it everything will make sense all the costs will be covered if you manage to secure a job in the uk okay okay so uh, this thing is okay so you mean to say that the finance part is also uh, available not freely but the student should try so the yeah. uh, do you feel that uh, a student who is having maybe one year of experience so what was the main uh, uh, like you said uh, some some mortgage needs to be uh basically provided right but uh, what happens in case of uh, loans granted to iim abc candidates is like uh, they get the loan on just the basis of their admission so is it in this also that if the student has got the uh, enrollment letter so they will get the finance or something needs to be mortgaged so for uh, for uh, public sector banks government banks they'll uh, they'll ask for mortgage definitely they are not going Uh, give the loan without mortgage hmm. private banks may ask or may not ask but then if uh, the private banks are not uh, slightly higher than government banks and um, also they don't they, they will not cover the entire cost of the course okay certain amount has to be bared from the pockets of the person who's taking the loan uh, nbfcs will cover the entire cost and okay. they, uh, but uh, the the issue is that their uh, uh, interest is very high okay so should the now is a buffer period uh, this i just want to mention one more thing uh, there is usually a buffer period given like 6 uh, months 3 months uh, depending on the bank that uh, the banks are willing to wait for this particular this much time after the completion of the course like this buffer uh, this buffer times helps you to actually secure a job and then start repaying so it's not like you just have to immediately pay after your course end okay so the one thing which i can make out uh, from your uh, talk is why you mentioned the work experience and now i can relate with it is securing a job in the uk right so if yeah. the students they plan to basically uh, get the uk route and they want to basically work in the uk so what i personally feel is if the student is not having that much work experience then the student needs to come back to india work for some time right and then only if the uh, company is an mnc company or maybe after 4 to 5 years of experience once uh, basically they are having good amount of experience then only they can try the international route but if uh, we consider a candidate like you where you have got 4 years of experience so now securing a job will be little bit easier if you have got some experience in the indian markets uh, so uh, to this i would point out that uh, if you have experience in the uk market like like if it's, uh, if you have work for pwc uk kpmg uk from the mumbai branch then it becomes easier for you to get a job so most companies look for most like 99% of the companies look for uk market experience only so even if you have indian market experience it's going to be a little difficult to secure jobs and coming to freshers uh, freshers there are graduate schemes available so uh, graduate schemes offered by the companies here in the uk so you'll have to apply through that so and the one challenge that freshers face is that they have to start applying from september only as soon as they enter the course that's when the, uh, all the companies roll out the graduate schemes and uh, the experience hires can start from may um, april may next year because for experienced roles the companies usually look for immediate joining like 2 3 months okay 
keeping in mind that uh, even if they take from some other company, they'll have to that person has to serve notice period. Okay. So the so, now, uh, yeah. So yeah, so I'm not saying that it is difficult for anyone to get a job. It's not very difficult to, for anyone to get a job, but then the road is not easy. Uh, and if you have UK market experience, it becomes easier. If you have even little work experience, it is easy. But uh, at a fresher level, you can get a job. Uh, some of my friends have secured graduate roles also here. But then you have to be, uh, you have to, uh, you have to be behind getting a job right from September. As soon as you enter the UK, you'll have to start, and all these parts will be covered in the induction, which is the first two weeks, which uh, when you uh, when you come to base. Okay, so basically the program is well guided. So the mm -hmm. candidates are guided. It's up to the student's talent, right? Okay. Yeah. So can you describe the program a little bit? As I have heard, there is a trimester system, and uh, basically, I, I don't have much knowledge. Okay, so correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong. And basically, the subjects, uh, like how many exemptions do we get in a year? What is the probability of getting? Since you know that uh, maybe in a class of hundred students, how many have got the exemption? So the students they get a clear picture. Yeah. So uh, I would like to start from uh, scratch. So basically, uh, uh, as I'll talk about uh, the documents required first. So you need to have your passports ready and uh, the IELTS score and uh, your transcript. So not many know about transcript because this is something not many Indian colleges uh, give unless requested for. So transcript is a must for um, students to get a job in the uh, to get a get a uh, education post grad education entry into the uk so a you need to have your transcript and you need to have two references as well your references could be your ex colleagues your present colleagues your manager anybody so uh, if you fulfill all these requests the uh, the uh, college will give you the Unconditional, uh, unconditional offer letter, post which you can apply for your CAS. CAS is a document which is required to enter the UK. And um, this CAS is usually issued in the month of July. And uh, this and it is important when you apply for your visa as well. And uh, coming to the visa part, uh, there is this particular very, very important part that I would like to mention that uh, the UKVI expects the candidate to hold the tuition fees, the remaining tuition fees. By remaining, I mean, as soon as you get as as soon as you get the conditional offer letter, conditional offer letter, as in like maybe your uh, IELTS goal is pending, transcript is pending, or uh, your references are pending. So the, uh, as soon as you apply for the uh, for this particular um, uh, is for this particular course, course, you get a conditional offer letter, and you will uh, you'll only get an un unconditional offer letter if you meet all the conditions I just mentioned a few, few minutes back. And um, so, uh, uh, so uh, after you get the casts, uh, and uh, you, the, uh, uh, after you get the cast, then you pay your deposit. Like deposit is usually two thousand uh, pounds, and uh, here about two lakh. Uh, here about two lakh. Yeah. Million. And assuming your tuition fees is around twenty three thousand pounds approximately, so you'll be remain so you'll be uh, remaining with approximately uh, twenty one thousand pounds. So twenty one thousand pounds plus nine uh, nine I think twelve hundred or thirteen hundred as the per month cost, which you have to show uh, uh, as per the UK government uh, laws. Uh, so uh, they have Your, to see uh, that you are... I'll, I'll just try to interrupt you like uh, 1200 1300 is your personal income or like what is it i didn't get that part 1200 to 1300 uh, uh, per month is the uk vi uh, uh, uk vi guideline which uh, every candidate must hold uh, uh, like every month uh, every month so as to ensure to them that uh, they are they will be uh, the, so that the candidate will be able to suffice their stay their own expenses in the uk for the remaining 12 months so what you mean to say is that uh, 1200 to 1300 pounds 
must be there with the candidate yeah so 1200 to 1300 pounds should be every every month so by that i mean uh, your cumulative would somehow somehow approximately come to suppose 12 lakhs okay so your remaining tuition fees plus 12 lakhs should be there for your uh, for you, for you to show to the ukvi for got it to, uh, got it 28 consecutive days okay so basically uh, it's a form yeah. of a security that the uk government takes so basically i got it so the remaining fees whatever is pending uh, once you move to the uk so maybe 10 lakhs of the fees is pending and more additional 12 to 13 lakhs we need to show because the average rent that i have heard is 1 lakh rupees per month like about the yeah. stay part so that is what the uk government is securing right and yeah uh, so you have to yeah you have to maintain that amount for tw- uh, 28 consecutive days in your bank okay and your statement and a letter from the bank manager along with your application uh, application form must be submitted uh, to the uh, visa office when you, when you are there for the got it. visa so so yeah. basically to avoid any sort of uh, liquidity issues or maybe so that that they are uh, basically this is a good point that additional that much amount of money should be there so that the co- like the university and the government is secured regarding yeah. this okay and as for the like uh, it's quite difficult to uh like we cannot like for example when we shift from maybe uh calcutta to ba- mumbai so it's quite easy to basically hunt a flat right but yeah. it cannot do it for the uk so how was the stay part uh, sorted by you the stay, uh, coming uh, the stay part was uh, sorted because the university has tie ups with two accommodations and it is on first come first serve basis alliance house and iq city was offered by uh, to the university alliance house is a 20 minute bus ride from uh, the university and iq city is quite close to uh, the university and uh, these two universities were offered by the uh, uh, by the you know the, these two accommodations were offered by the university basically and uh, so it's uh, so if you are applying as soon as you get a message or a mail from the university make sure do it, you do it as soon as possible because once the allotment starts you'll realize that if uh, because of the delay other people are getting allotted before you got it and even if you don't make it through these uh, accommodations there are the accommodations available as well chapter old street and other uh, which is very close to the college so uh, uh, and i would prefer i would actually advise everyone to stay in a student accommodation only because there will be many other students from the same university and uh, you will have uh, a lot of interac- interaction sessions with them you'll get to hang out with them you learn their experiences and if you choose a private flat have then you won't get uh, to meet a lot of people from your course uh, apart from college times and you won't even get to interact from other courses uh, from people from the other courses as well so it's best to go for student accommodations only okay so the like uh, like i just uh... before the session like uh, we just had a research uh, like uh, during your time it was maybe two exams but currently uh, it's four exams including the papers which you mentioned if i'm not wrong like the entry into your program like uh, yeah, so actually, eligibility yeah. part so every uh, so every th- four or five years they change the structure so i think that's what i heard that this year the new batch will be coming under the new structure we were okay. the last under the current structure okay. so for us the structure was like uh, uh, the course was divided into three parts three terms basically in the first term we had the uh, cp1 part 1 which is mandatory to take apart from then apart from that you have to choose two S- uh, one sp in term 1 so in term 1 you get an option of sp2 life insurance uh, general insurance reserving and capital modeling and uh, sp4 pensions and other benefits we'll look at the chat afterwards you can continue so these three sps are offered in the first semester and uh, you have to choose one of those sps this uh, and uh, cp1 part 1 is mandatory 
so basically cp1 as we know there are two exams so basically part 1 is there in the first uh, uh, part and also one sp okay yeah i'm com uh, coming to second term second term uh, again you have cp1 part 2 which is mandatory and uh, and then you have another sp that you have to take so in second term the college offers sp1 health and care sp5 investments and uh, finance and investment a sp6 finance and investment b uh, sp8 general insurance uh, pricing so like, this is similar to the first term only apart from that we had a we had an additional subject so we had a choice bit uh, among uh, cp2 cf2 and cm2 so uh, so the, so basically the structure is says that you you do cp1 part 1 in term 1 cp1 part 2 in term 2 these two subjects are mandatory and you do two sps in each uh, one in one in each semester and uh, up, and in the second and uh, second semester you have one additional subject to pick up and uh, you have to choose among cp2 scs2 and cm2 Okay, so among these, we can choose any one. Yeah. Okay. So for us, CP three, CP three was non credit based subjects. So yeah, so these all subjects that I spoke to you about has credits based on the uh, based on the college guidelines. They have credits. CP three is also an exemption based subject, but it does not have credits. So okay. to complete your master's degree, you need one eighty five credits. and uh, even if you were doing cp3 or not doing cp3 it does it did not matter because it was not a credit based subject for us so cp3 was um, there in both the semesters c uh, so term 1 and 2 term 2 and uh, so for us cp3 was like in term 1 and term 2 there will be various assignments given by the professor and uh, one has to uh, actually score minimum number of marks combined in all those assignments to actually sit for the final exam which happens in at the end of term 2 so this is how cp3 for was for us but apparently if i'm not wrong cp3 is no more a credit based subject for us coming uh, starting from this year's batch uh, it was also uh, so basically uh, you can do it or you may not do it but yeah there is it has got nothing to do with your uh, mandatory credits if i'm as yeah, far as i can think out right this is what uh, this is something which was the criteria for us this was how it was for us but i think uh, this structure has changed the cp3 structure has changed for, uh, this year it has been moved only to term that, that's completely okay so little bit uh, the students will also research okay it's it's as yeah. per your Uh, best knowledge. So, so don't you don't need to basically worry about the yeah. changes part. As I rightly pointed out that in your time maybe it was two exams, but currently uh, as per their website is showing it's four exams. So, uh, yeah. Shweta, there are not three terms. There are two terms, right? First there is another term, term three. So, term three is not related to your actuarial subjects. So, you have you have an option to do a business research project or a applied research project. or two five electives i went for five electives and um, this is not any where related to your exemptions this exactly. is only for your degree okay. and to get your exemptions it is important to get your degree so this is why okay. you have to go through the, these subjects also okay so shadda like uh, one thing which i can make out there is a maybe a myth again a myth breaker for all us thank you so much that all the papers get exempt all the papers get exempt go to the uk for one year all the papers get exempt so this is again a myth so as mm -hmm. you all can know like uh, the college from where she is pursuing is the best okay because i know this uh, like uh, in her batch we are having maybe 15 plus candidates those who are associated with us okay and uh, so we can make out there are two sps one uh, among uh it's uh, either cp2 or cm2 or cs2 right and there is cp1 correct 
Yeah, one SP and uh, CP one part two and uh, a choice between the three subjects that uh, Praveen Bhaiya just mentioned. Okay, so so the like, don't you think that the candidate should have uh, the CMCS and the CB so that the candidate can get uh, the CP and the SP exempt, and then the candidate needs to give uh, SA. Okay, or maybe if the candidate can have uh cp2 and not any one of the cs2 or cm2 maybe because they are quite difficult to crack nowadays so the planning should be that before going to the university the candidate must be done with the cb uh cm1 cs1 and uh, any one of the cm2 or maybe uh cs2 and if you are working then you must be having good knowledge of Excel. So I'll I'll always uh, prefer CM two or maybe CS two over CP two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, ideally, uh, you should you should have uh, either cleared CS two uh, or CM two or CP two. So ideally, uh, CS two is uh, given. Uh, what I know, IFOA students really struggle to clear CS two, and uh, R is just a coursework here. So. Uh, like uh, so for all the papers uh, 100 marks is your written examination but it holds 80 percent weightage only 20 marks is for coursework so that's a group coursework and for it is uh, it is based on the professor what coursework they want uh, they want to give you and many students don't take this coursework light uh, don't take this coursework seriously ideally these coursework's can help you with exemptions or stop you from getting exemptions see it's not easy to score marks here we literally and struggle Shraddha, okay so yeah. Shraddha, like uh, uh, since uh, what i know is uh, there is a 75 percentage requirement so what is basically uh, the marks requirement on how do you basically get the subject exempt yeah so um so basically uh if you uh, so you, you one should have minimum 60 percent aggregate by aggregate i mean aggregate um a uh, 60 percent in uh average and average and by average i mean average of cp1 part one cp1 part two and uh, both your sps average should be more than 60 percent subject to the condition that you have uh, you have minimum 15 each subject so it goes like even if you're not able to clear your papers individually but your average of cp1 part 1 part 2 S, uh, and both your sps is above 60 then you are eligible to get actuarial exemptions for these subjects okay and this this is a very good thing which has been put by the university because it really helps guys uh it really helps and uh this actuarial average does not consider your fourth subject which is ts2 cm2 or cp2 you have to pass that on an individual basis usually the cutoff for ts2 and cm2 goes as high as 65. and uh coming to cs2 R is just a coursework which holds uh, some weightage, so it's it's quite easier to score CS2 uh, score in CS2 from base. So I suggest uh, my suggestion is that if you have work experience, may just be done with C, uh, CP2 and CM2, and go for CS2 here. Term two is gonna be challenging because you have three subjects along with courseworks. Courseworks takes a lot of time. Even though it's a group coursework and it just holds twenty percent weightage, but it's very difficult. It takes a lot of time. It uh, it uh, so term two is not going to be a cakewalk at all. Uh, pe people really struggle in term two. But my suggestion is, it's just a matter of three four months in term two. You'll be able to score uh, well in. Uh, be you'll be able to uh, get done with CS two if you uh it's, it's actually easier to get uh, to score in cs2 from base than in, from ifo it's comparatively very easier okay so there are people who have uh, flunked in cs2 here it's hmm. not like uh, very easy 
but in comparison to ifo you'll easily get through in cs2 here so as per the route you suggest that cs2 a student may take up maybe cm2 or yeah. cs2 because cp2 because cp2 is definitely easier than uh, cm2 yeah. and cs2 okay yeah. so shadda like uh, now i would like to talk about the experience so uh, how is the experience different from the regular colleges here in india and see uh, the student will be taking a lot of extra effort to get into these universities so what difference you feel in yourself and what addition uh, you have in yourself in your skill set in your knowledge level so that it is worth uh, taking these uh, courses because see being from a marwari family being very honest i am of the mindset that i'll be happy to spend maybe 4 lakh rupees and i'll get these six papers done by giving the exams and i'll not spend maybe 40 to 45 lakh rupees considering 12 lakh rupees on the uh, home accommodation 28 lakh rupees on the education plus with no guarantee that i am going to get recruited in the uk and uh, travel expenses are so expensive maybe uh, uh, like going out on the weekends whenever i'm free so in 10% of the cost i am basically uh, maybe with some extra struggle like you rightly pointed out maybe it may be 10% easier to clear the exams uh, once you go to base or maybe any other university but it's not that it's very easy maybe the difficulty level reduces by 10 to 15% so what extra value creation you feel in yourself so that it's worth taking the course this is the average student mindset that i'm talking about yeah so firstly are you um like i have some years of experience and there are many other people who come here with experience so okay, there are many indians we are approximately 24 indians in our batch and most many of them have our experience you get to interact with them you get to know their journey how they uh, you you know that's how you make contacts also you talk to alumni you may, you, you get uh, contacts you you and coming to a university in base uh, like base which is situated in central london in itself is a very big thing so uh, like you get you ex- you interact with people from other countries as well you get to know how insurance works in their country you uh, you make contacts through them as well and you meet the professors like some professors here like the professor who teaches at sp8 he is cfo of score so you there are uh, and uh, you know the teacher who teaches S- cp3 and the pension subject he has written the formula book table which you guys use so you meet such people so you interact with them and you, uh, and uh, this is something which is not available this such an opportunity is not available in india and uh, and it also helps with your communication skill you interact with people on a daily to do a basis in english you go out you make friends your personality improves you are much more confident than you were this and then uh, like in in the uk you don't have any uh, you don't have any uh, house helps so you also become self sustained like you get to know everything and you 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 are so much independent so much more independent than you were before so you have to do your cleaning you have to do your cooking and this is not a demotivation but you should take it as a thing that you actually grow as a person because you know everything by the end of one year these are the basic skills that one must have and uk teaches you everything okay So Shraddha, uh, my last question and official question to you. Then we'll open the house for questions. Is that uh, the program starts in September, right? So yeah. what? How did you go? Like how many months prior you started the planning and started getting things done? Approximately how many months before the student must apply? So a rough uh, timetable. Uh, you should have at least apply five six months before, and there is a scholarship also available. uh of around 5000 pounds and if you apply before may and you get your unconditional offer letter you are also eligible to apply for the scholarship but if you are very late in applying uh then uh, you lose out on the chance to get a scholarship as well and again like i said the accommodation is on first come first serve basis uh, uh, until you apply for your uh apply with the college you won't get uh, an email from them stating that these are the particular um, tie ups 
that they have with the uh, accommodations uh, so it's better the sooner that you apply the better for you okay thank you so much radha a lot of uh, basically myths i personally didn't know a lot of things now we'll open the house for questions and yes you all can ask questions we'll take few questions and then we'll end and definitely we'll conduct more such sessions with uh, shraddha whenever she is free so that we get to know in totality about the uh, program so as of now which university it's based you can just research okay what cgpa we, she already rightly pointed out okay regarding the uh, exam uh, uh, getting the exemption criteria so any more questions which the students uh, want to ask you all can basically uh, uh, put it in the chat box and we can take these okay so basically one question sada which i also have is that uh, you pointed out that uh, uh, once if you are uh, pass you once you are if if you get 50 plus in every subject and 60% in aggregate so it's like for example if we don't get the 60% aggregate okay mm -hmm. so we don't pass all the three or how is it go or how does it go so even if you fail to get 60% in aggregate uh then um, what happens is that they see your marks in individual subjects okay so and you should get pass also yeah, individual pass also yeah okay got got okay so uh one one student is asking since you are there in the uk so what is the knowledge that you gather regarding the average pay scale so uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned a, a person with maybe 4 years of experience who uh, is almost near to qualification the minimum pay in india that we get is roughly 22 lakhs maybe 20 to 22 lakhs on average so uh what is the rough pay scale that the uk market uh, suffices this is the question that one of the student is asking see for graduate schemes for freshers the pay scale goes around uh, 32 35000 pounds oh. not more than that hmm. and uh, uh, for uh, experience it goes above 45 okay. but then it depends on the segment you are working in the industry you are working on uh, general pay is higher which is not the case in india life pay is higher in india but here the general pay is higher than life and it's easier to procure jobs in general also compared to life here got it got it so don't uh, look at the flashy figure of 45000 pounds because the stay is very expensive <laughs> in yeah. mumbai you get a 1 bhk maybe in 15 to 20000 there it costs 1 lakh so definitely if you don't get a minimum of 60 to 70 lakhs you will not have the same parity that you have in india okay this is that i know okay but definitely experience matters you can basically downgrade your lifestyle and yes uh, it's all about the experience you are young you have the uk market experience for maybe 3 uh, to 4 years and then you might grow there but in terms of pay if you don't get a minimum of 60 lakhs if you are getting maybe uh, 25 lakhs in india i don't think it's worth uh, basically unless and until you are very passionate about working in U in the uk markets that is what i have gathered from my knowledge but definitely a lot of students they go even if the pay is roughly 50 to 55 lakhs because uh, it's all about the experience now you are young i think if you set aside the money part the experience is quite different that is what we all are looking for shraddha if i'm not wrong right okay so uh okay so are there any other universities yes definitely we have prepared a document there is kent there is heriot pot there is uh, waterloo okay there are a lot of any other many universities we uh, will share the document okay as you mentioned there is a 60% minimum aggregate for exemptions where what is your lag in only one subject uh, so aditi there is no reappearing in this okay if you pass there is the Okay, yeah, so for reappearing, I would like to mention that even if you fail to uh, like secure fifty marks in one particular subject or to any of the subject, you can reappear and sec and but then your capping comes to fifty. In reset, the maximum score that you can get is fifty only. And uh, even after reset, your actual exemptions, your actual average becomes sixty percent. Then you are eligible. 
to get exemptions why well, why the maximum is 50 the maximum is 50 because 50 is the passing marks got it and oh basically even if you score 70 they will give you 50 50 only yeah. got it got it got it so basically you can pass on the uh, average uh, thing yeah you need to do well in other subjects got it it's quite it's yeah. quite so even if you are not... lacking behind in one subject and you you've done really well in the other it really got pulls your average hmm. and uh, actually the average is actually a savior for all of us According to you, ideally, how much exam should a person pass? We, uh, at this chanchal, we already pointed out that uh, the, you should clear the. If if you want that, once your masters is done, uh, you should be left with only the essay paper. As Shraddha pointed out, we we mutually agreed. It's not only I'm speaking. It's like you should get done with the CM one, CS one, CB series, CP two, and preferably CM two. Yeah. Okay. What is the per month cost of living? Beta, it's roughly one point two five lakhs. Uh, Shraddha, will you uh, like to point out a uh, per month cost of living? Like the, like what is it about and how to go? Like, yeah. So uh, it depends on the kind of accommodation you are living in. So if you take Alliance House, it's on the very cheap end and it's a really nice accommodation, and uh, it will cost you around eighty ninety eight eighty thousand eighty five thousand per month in INR and uh, your living cost depends on your standard of living. So if you're eating outside, okay, it can so go 85,000 is just the rent or it includes fooding and only only rent. Okay, so it's roughly 1.5 maybe. No, that is uh, for Alliance House only. If you take other accommodations, which is next to college, they will go above 1 lakh. It can go somewhere between 1 lakh to 1 lakh 60, 70,000. Okay, it's a one BHK, one 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 room. Not a one BHK on suite. So there will be a, a, there will be a flat. There'll be like six seven rooms and one common kitchen. Got it. Got it. In Alliance House, but if you're going for those accommodations which are next to college, they'll be providing you uh, studios wherein your room the, where where you'll have your kitchen come room, uh, like kitchen come room and a separate washroom for yourself. Okay, so Shraddha, like uh, we have seen in some movies that uh, those who are uh, basically struggling in the UK, they work some part-time jobs, some odd jobs. So what is the reality? So do we get the jobs very easily? And how do people see uh, you once you're doing those odd jobs? Maybe uh, we have seen people working at a hamburger, uh, like I am talking about movies. So we have seen them uh, working in a hamburger store and they get paid on an hourly basis. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if the students, they want and they can basically try to uh, reimburse some of the cost by working. So is it possible? The balance is possible. And uh, like, how, how do you do? How do you go about that? Yes. Uh, so a lot of students do work with uh, hospitality firms like Delaware North Arc Hospitality. Uh, like you just have to register with those firms and they'll come back to you and then they'll provide you the access to an app. And uh, whenever there is an event in a football stadium that that particular company that you have registered with has uh, tie up with, they'll uh, just send you a notification. You just have to uh, make yourself available for that day and come for the event, they'll tell you the timings and everything and based on the number of hours you've worked, they'll, your, your pay will vary. So roughly what is the pay per hour and basically? Uh, pay per hour is around 11.5 uh, to 13.5. How frequently per... do you get these uh, opportunities there? So uh, if you're on student visa, you are not allowed to work more than 20 hours and make sure you don't cross 20 hours because that will create a problem with post-study work visa. Uh, so 20 when you are applying, per month or per week? Per week, per week. Per, okay, got it, got it. Yeah. So part-time, you have a query solve, right? I don't tum suggest any actual student to go for a part-time because the course itself is very hectic, especially term two. Term 3 you can do because term 3 is all bananas for us because there is no exemptions. But uh, and term 1 you take time to settle in. Okay. So I suggest, so, we, uh, yeah. I suggest not to go for part-time because there were 
like some there were very few people who were doing part time in my batch uh, but then they were struggling with their papers so okay. i suggest not to do it yeah okay so one uh, one particular query which uh, i am having is uh, what are the class schedule like uh, do you have lectures every day and what is the like how does a day look like like a week maybe if you can describe in 5 minutes and then we can close the session so uh, classes are are not there every day you uh, so approx there is a lecture of 3 uh, hours per subject every week so in term 1 you'll have 3 hours of cp1 part 1 3 hours of uh, C- of the nesp you've taken and uh, every year the schedule changes the number of hours do remain the same but the schedule changes so it, it depends on the schedule you get for the year that how many days you'll be coming to college okay so it's like you get in a week 6 hours of lecture like 3 hours for each subject so uh, in a week uh, there are two sessions live and what is the rest of the day look like like how how do you go about that so uh, so 3 hours live and the rest of the day you can do anything you want so, so, like basically term 1 has 6 hours of lectures and uh, term 2 has uh, like 9 um, hours of lectures nine because there will be three subjects yeah. so okay. and rest of the day you can do anything you can uh, do whatever you want you can like do your course works you can do some reading in the library so how do you spend your week Uh, honestly term 1 was uh, like term 1 i i took a lot of time settling here learning cooking <laughs> and then uh, a lot of time went in uh, went in course works uh, so when you are coming for the course make sure you have hands on experience uh, am i audible yeah you have some hands on experience in uh, r and vba because it will make life okay. easier for you here vba uh, so part cp1 part 1 coursework is totally on vba and uh, it is a very difficult coursework to do so if you already have and for those who are appearing for cs2 make sure you already know r uh, so if you have hands on experience on these two softwares your life will be pretty easier here okay okay so uh, thank you so much shraddha and uh, it was really a, like a uh, eye opener for the students those who want to jinko uran bharni hai and uh, those who want to basically study abroad and thank you so much guys for attending this session thank you thank you so much shraddha thank you no just thank you thank you